and that's Adriana Doss. So Adriana, uh, if you are uh, ready to share your screen. Sure, you just wanna check first, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Okay, excellent. Great. Okay, so I'll go ahead and share screen. So first, my apologies for the change in order. Thank you, Marco, for being so flexible. Um, Zoom decided it was uh, gonna have a bit of a tantrum today. All right, hopefully you can see my slides now. Yes, we can see your slides. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I'll I'll launch it. Yeah, take, um, it, take it away. Yeah. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so again, my apologies for the switch in the uh, in the order there. Uh, hopefully, this is the last of, of the Zoom problems for today. So uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give a talk today. And thanks to everyone who's joining online. Um, I've really been enjoying all the great talks in this series. So uh, it's a really an honor to be uh, to be part of uh, part of today's uh, series. So I'm going to talk today about some recent work uh, that we've been doing on quantifying approximate symmetries in biological systems. And this work was done in collaboration with Veronica Chokinel, who's now at Duke University, Puneet Gandhi at uh, Virginia Commonwealth University, and Carl, Carl Nicholas, who's at Cornell. All right, so to start with some very broad context, the ideas here that are really grounded in trying to understand processes in development. And I think development is a really fascinating process because we take a single cell, a fertilized egg, with one copy of the genome, and it gives rise to a mature organism, such as Ryan Reynolds, uh, with a trillion or so cells, right? So from one cell to about a trillion. And so in the process of making an organism, such as Ryan Reynolds, then cells need to make a series of decisions and adopt particular cell fates to make patterns that we associate with a, a mature organism. And the patterns that we see can range across many different scales from patterning within a single cell to patterns that stretch across entire tissues. And we often associate these patterns with symmetries ultimately in the mature organism, such as a bilateral left-right symmetry that we have and, and Ryan Reynolds has. There we go. So this leads to the question of, well, how, how do cells make these patterning decisions? Now, during development, cells have to make these patterns at the right time in the right place to give rise to the highly patterned and symmetric functional multicellular organisms such as our cells. And they have to make these decisions in incredibly noisy and busy environments. So here we're watching the first cell cycle of a nematode worm, C. elegans, and we can see the spatial patterning happening right in this first cell cycle prior to first division. So we see on the top row there, we've got this reorganization, proteins are being moved around and segregating to opposite ends of the cell. Uh, down on the bottom, we've got more kind of the structural mechanical based movement. So we've got the, the, the centrosomes are moving, pulling the pronuclei around. Um, so there's a lot of spatial patterning that we see here due to all of these different features in the cell, biochemical, mechanical, and geometric, that all interact to allow for the spatial patterning, which is critical for cell fate specification, um, not only in C. elegans, but also in, in many other organisms. And it's these interactions that are the focus of my lab's research. So in my lab, we're interested in understanding how cells integrate all of this information, the biochemical, mechanical, and geometric information, in order to make appropriate cell fate decisions during development. And by closely integrating mathematical and experimental approaches, we're able to probe the fundamental properties of the regulatory networks that underlie these important decisions during development. Now, one particular mechanism for giving rise to different cell fates during development involves breaking symmetry. We've already seen some of this before in the videos, right? We've got this, the, we break symmetry from a homogeneous distribution of proteins in the beginning to a spatially heterogeneous protein distribution as we approach that first division. And so the resulting asymmetric division, and so we can see that here in a second. And again, this is the early C. elegans embryo, and it results in two very different daughter cells that give rise to different tissues, so somatic cells and germline cells in the mature organism. 
So these symmetries and, and asymmetries are really clear in the segregation of proteins to opposite ends of the cell, as well as in different geometric features of the cell. So on the bottom, we've got a schematic from a, uh, another paper where we looked at, we exploited the rotational symmetry uh, in the cell to develop a model to look at different geometric features in that first cell cycle. Now, but this led us to ask kind of a bigger question, because what do we really mean when we say symmetry? And, uh, and what I found was when I went into the literature to try to see how people were defining symmetry, it often wasn't actually explicitly defined. It was more of a, you know, we, we know it when we see it. And so in particular, most of us are familiar, at least intuitively, with the mathematical defini definition of symmetry. And this is often the concept that we have in mind when we talk about symmetry. Now, really briefly, it just means invariance under a specified transformation. So for instance, here we've got a five-pointed star. So, if, so we've got the two images of the star. So if we look at the image on the left, we see the line, that axis that we've drawn, is not an axis of symmetry because when we reflect the image over that axis, right? So go back and forth a couple of times. So we can see that when we do that re reflection, we don't recover the original object. So in other words, it's not invariant under reflection across that axis. Whereas with the star and the axis on the right, so that that tilted axis, when we reflect across that axis, so again, flipping between slides there, we see that the star image is invariant and therefore it is a symmetry axis of that five-pointed star shape. So reflection of the star about a vertical axis is not a symmetry, but reflection about the tilted axis is a symmetry of the star shape when we use that mathematical definition of invariance under a transformation. And there's lots of different types of transformations that are used in the context of symmetry, uh, things like reflections, we can also have rotations, translations, scaling, so a lot of different ways that we can look at invariance under a specific transformation. So when we talk about symmetry, we're often thinking about this kind of mathematical definition of invariance. And so let's, oh, that's the flipping side. There we go. Now, what about when we consider objects that are found in nature, including Ryan Reynolds, and we can ask the same question, are these objects symmetric? And I think most people would say, yes, we've got, for instance, bilateral symmetry in the embryo on the left. Uh, we've got a flower with rotational symmetry. We've got a leaf and a desmid also with this bilateral symmetry. Ryan Reynolds again. And so I think most people would say, yes, these natural objects have symmetry properties. But what happens when we actually look at these images under a transformation? Now, some of these are closer than others. So for instance, the embryo is pretty close, except, you know, if you look closely, you can see some squiggles where, where the, they don't exactly line up under a reflection transformation. Um, in the flower, you can see the petals really don't match up perfectly when we rotate by two pi by five. The leaf and the desmid, the algae are again, pretty close, but there's, you know, again, you look at the tip of the leaf, there's a bit of divergence there. Uh, when we overlay the desmid, uh, it's kind of blurry because again, it's not really matching up. And uh, in Ryan Reynolds' face, when we reflect the right side and reflect the left side and compare to his actual face, we can see some clear differences. So reflecting the, the right, uh, we can see it's much skinnier overall compared to his face and then much broader when we reflect the left side. So all of these actually fail to meet the mathematical definition of, a, definition of invariance under a transformation. So strictly speaking, these images are actually not symmetric if we adhere to the mathematical definition of symmetry. But all of these organisms, including Ryan Reynolds, clearly possess some symmetry properties. So that led us to ask the related question, well, how can we quantify approximate symmetries, such as those that we naturally see in uh, biological systems? And so we explored this question in a recent paper uh, that appeared in 2021. And I'll have, uh, I'll have a link to the code actually that's used for uh, the method that we propose, as well as the, uh, uh, the, the paper at the end of the talk. 
And so what we did is uh, we proposed a, a, a new method based uh, that we call transformation information, which is an entropy entropy based quantification of symmetry. So I'm just going to step through the process of this method and how it gives us information about approximate symmetries in biological systems. All right, so the first thing that we need to do is to process the image, um, in particular to enhance uh, the symmetries that are, or enhance the, uh, uh, the difference uh, between different parts of the image. So in this case, we enhanced the green channel, and there you can see it as a, a binary black and white, uh, to really pull out the features of the biological system that we're interested in. Uh, and this again is the desmid, it's an algae. So we process the image uh, to enhance the green and extract the intensities, which uh, we call, uh, which is a function mu. All right, step 1.1, if you want to. Um, so certain other me measures of symmetry have a lot of user input associated with them. Uh, we wanted to make this as hands-off as possible. Um, so you can find the center uh, by, uh, by using our method. And so basically minimizing over all possible points uh, of, of the center of the image and finding the point that minimizes uh, the transformation information uh, globally. Uh, so it's a way of, you can use the method to find the center of the image as well. Not entirely necessary if you wanna do it by hand though. So then step two is to actually calculate the transformation information function for a family of transformations. So here we're looking at reflections about an axis that's at an angle theta from horizontal. And, uh, and so we, the, I've got the function here, but basically what it is, is we're looking at, so mu of X is a positive definite function of the intensity so that we extracted from the image in the previous step. T sub A is the transformation of interest. So here it's reflection about an axis. And then we've got D tilde as a normalization, uh, which is the domain intersection of both the original and the transformed image. And so in this case, we're looking at a reflection uh, at a, about an axis at angle theta. And so we, uh, at each angle theta, we calculate the TI function. It returns, it's a single valued function and uh, which compares the transformed object to the original one. So here we're calculating the value of the TI function for each axis of reflection from zero to 360 degrees. So incrementing, uh, by one degree and uh, creating a TI curve as a function of the angle theta. And since mathematically symmetry transformations leave the object unchanged, we define the approximate symmetry as the transformation that results in the least changes from the original image. And this is represented by the minimum of the TI curve and the predicted axis we can see on the right uh, in the image of the Desmond. So not only can we identify symmetry axes for these images or central points that minimize um, uh, the, uh, the, the that give us the best fit for our uh, transformation information. But the magnitude of the minimum, because you can see that the, that the minima in our TI curve, it doesn't go all the way down to zero, right? Because it's not a perfect uh, image, perfect symmetry under that transformation, but it's the one that does minimize the amount of information lost by approximating our original image by the transformed image. And so the magnitude of the minima, so how far away it is from zero, gives an indication of just how, how good or bad, uh, how far away the transformed image is from being perfectly symmetric. And so again, we can interpret this uh, method as quantifying the amount of information lost by approximating the original image by the transformed image. All right, so as a first example of this measure, let's consider the phylogeny or evolutionary relationship of angiosperms, more commonly known as flowering plants. Now, flowers have many interesting and varied symmetry properties. I, I, I love looking at flowers and there's, there's such variety in the shapes that we see. So here we have a really beautiful poster. It's actually available for free download from Plant Gateway. And it shows the evolutionary relationship between different types of flowering plants. And we've got the phylogenetic tree, a little bit hard to see, but that middle plant panel there is the phylogenetic tree, which establishes the common ancestor of these flowering plants. Now, that the, the phylogenetic relationships, that's based primarily on molecular data, but it does also take into account uh, morphogenetic features such as flower shape. 
And we can use our transformation information method to quantify the approximate symmetries possessed by these flowers. So here's two specific examples of flowers with very different symmetry properties. So on the left, we've got a member of the verbena family. And this flower has, again, I, I think, Intuitively, we can see it has a five-fold rotational symmetry. And we can see that reflected very clearly in the minima of the TI function. So of course, one of the minima corresponds to the trivial rotation of zero degrees, which gives us a TI value of zero, right? Because if you don't rotate the image, you're gonna recover perfectly the original image. Um, and we can see that the other minima, so in that TI by rotation on the on top left there, so we can see that the other minima are low, but not quite zero, reflecting slight differences in petal shape and size. And on the right, we have another flower that has a strongly bilateral symmetry. This is a flower from the uh, mint or sage family. Uh, very, if, I, if you ever look at, say, rosemary flowers, um, they have this kind of uh, symmetry to them. And so when we look at the TI by rotation, we again have the trivial zero rotation, giving us the perfect symmetry. And then a second very strong minima corresponding to a rotation of 180 degrees. We can also see that bilateral symmetry reflected in the TI by reflection on the bottom there. So we're able to pick out these features, these symmetry features with the TI function. And so here, uh, expanding the, the method further, we've got flowers from very closely related species. They're all from the Lamialis family, but that show a lot of variability in the flower shapes and symmetries. So by applying principal component analysis to project the TI curves into a lower dimensional space, just to, to better quantify uh, changes that we're seeing in the TI curves, we're able to actually quantify the transition from radial symmetry towards the left uh, to, to more of a bilateral symmetry on the right-hand side. So uh, by, by using principal component analysis, projecting that into a lower dimensional space, then we're able to show how the TI curve can, can show the transition from different types of symmetries here from rotational to bilateral symmetries. And we applied the principal component analysis to all appropriate flower pictures from that phylogeny poster that I showed earlier. And members of each group, each flower group, are indicated by different colored dots in the principal component plane. So what we see is that based on changes in floral symmetry, we actually can't distinguish between different flower groups. There's no kind of symmetry fingerprint that's associated with particular flower types. So in other words, this is actually evidence for convergent evolution within the different major lineages, because we have a reiteration of changes in symmetries across all of these different groups. And this convergence could be due to many different factors, such as selection pressure for pollination mechanisms. Um, but nevertheless, we have this uh, nice argument for convergent evolution based on our, our method. And of course, we can use this method to quantify the loss and emergence of symmetries during development. So by calculating the TI for developing organisms at different time points and projecting the TI curves using principal component analysis, we can quantify the emergence of symmetries during development. So here we're looking at embryonic development that's all through the, the, the embryonic phase to hatching of the nematode worm C. elegans. And in this case, despite the fact that the worm is actually undergoing very major changes, as we can see from that in vivo movie on the left-hand side, but because the early embryo is constrained by an eggshell, then the transformation information, both by rotation and by reflection, is really constrained to the symmetries of that eggshell. This is reflected by our data in the principal component plane. Each time point is represented by one red dot. And we see there's not a lot of movement in the principal component plane, as we would expect based on the, on the shape of our transformation information functions. So when we apply it to something like a zebrafish embryo, we start with a similar symmetry as the worm. We've got a very nearly spherical shape, very simple rotational symmetry. But he, and here, the zebrafish time points are indicated by green dots in the principal component plane. All of the C. elegans points are already there and drawn in red. So as we have the body elongation, in particular as the tail grows, then we see this divergence from that very simple symmetry. And this is reflected by that upwards movement in the principal component plane. 
And similarly, when we look at early development, uh, here we're looking at the plant Arabidopsis, we again start from a very simple symmetry. And so here Arabidopsis is shown by the blue dots, C. elegans in red, zebrafish in green. And we can see the elongation and expansion in the growth of the plant, which is again reflected in the evolution of the TI function, uh, as we see it both in the, in the surface plots and in the principal component plane. So for all three organisms, despite starting out with very similar symmetries, we see divergence as they develop in very different ways by tracking their trajectory, in particular the trajectory of the TI function, over time using this principal component analysis. All right, so to summarize, um, the method that we propose, transformation information, helps us quantify symmetry relationships between uh, in an organism uh, or between different organisms that are evolutionary, uh, evolutionarily related, uh, such as the flowers, to understand changes that occur over uh, evolutionary time scales. Um, and, and it can help us quantify evolutionary divergence or convergence. This method also allows us to quantify changes during development as, as organisms go from very simple geometries and symmetries, uh, such as a fertilized egg or seed, and evolve into a mature organism with more complex symmetries. And by comparing symmetries among different species and organisms, we can demonstrate commonalities, uh, we can uh, show where differences lie, and also track the emergence of complex structures over for evolutionary as well as developmental time. So uh, this gives us a new tool that will help us to dissect the role of coming back to what we focus on in my lab uh, to di really dissect the role of biochemical, mechanical, and geometric features involved in sulfate specification. So I've just highlighted a few of the applications that, that we've looked into, but there's really many, many more possible applications of transformation information. So we're really just getting started uh, with what we can do with this measure. And uh, so just to acknowledge uh, my lab members, as well as my collaborators, Veronica, Puneet, and Carl on this project, uh, if anybody's interested in playing around with the transformation information, you can scan the QR code and that will take you to the GitHub page. Uh, it has both the code uh, that calculates the measure as well as some example files for you to play around with. Uh, again, this is... Uh, based on the method that we proposed in our 2021 paper. Uh, there's a word cloud of, uh, of the paper, so you can see symmetry was uh, definitely a, a, a big feature in, in that paper. And thanks to my funding sources for uh, supporting all of the work that we do in my lab. And then finally, we are hiring a postdoc. This is for an NIH R01 funded project. And in particular, I'm looking for somebody who really loves the modeling side, that quantitative side of biology. Um, the uh, application uh, uh, site is open. So again, you can scan the QR code or follow the link that's there on the bottom of the slide. Um, application reviews are already in progress and the position will remain open until filled. So uh, yeah, if, the, if, if some of these ideas are uh, appealing to you and you're looking for a postdoc position, uh, please, uh, please apply or get in touch with me and I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adriana, for a wonderful talk. So there is already a question for you in the chat. And uh, Arvind, do you want to ask it directly or I can, I can ask it for you? Uh, sure. Um, yeah. Hi, Adriana. Love, uh, great talk, as always. Uh, I, I, hope Ryan, question. I hope Ryan Reynolds doesn't mind uh, being uh, <laughs> the subject of my talk. <laughs> 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 so I had a question about the TI metric, like if you use it in noisier samples, like for example, you had the um, in chemical intensity profiles, where, which are slightly noisier, uh, is it still sensitive um, in finding the minima? Can you comment on that, please? Yes, absolutely. I, a fabulous question. One that we're actually actively looking into right now. So uh, it, it, so the, the short answer is yes, that it's actually remarkably good at still finding those minima. Now, part of it, this is where maybe a little bit of that user, uh, um, be, because there's no threshold, right? And, and that's kind of what we were trying to get at with this measure, was that mathematically, there's, there's this very rigid threshold between symmetric and not symmetric. And, uh, and that's not really appropriate for biological organisms. So we, you have a minima and it's very good at finding minima, but then there is also a little bit of a judgment call in terms of, well, how far does the minima have to be away from zero before you consider the object to be asymmetric? So again, thinking, thinking that Ryan Reynolds, 
right? I, I mean, I don't think anybody would argue that his face is not bilaterally symmetric, but again, visually, it's, it's not a perfect symmetry. And, uh, and so the method is very good at finding those minima, but then there is a bit of a judgment call as to when you, you still consider an object to be symmetric or asymmetric. And in terms of actually quantifying what that transition might look like, so we're doing things like starting from a circle and then uh, and deforming into an ellipse to see if we, to, to really track that uh, transition from a rotational to a bilateral symmetry. So again, to see what that looks like in terms of the emergence of the minima. And also looking at things like taking that five-pointed star and just jiggling the point. So what happens if, uh, you know, what if one point goes way off and so the rest of it is perfectly symmetric? How does that affect the minima that we get? And if we, if we apply a little bit of noise to the different points and then jiggle them around, again, how does that affect the curve overall as well as the placement of the minima and, and, and the, the height of the minima as well. So these are all very much open questions that we're looking at. I don't have any good answers uh, other than to say that, that it, it is, the, the method is remarkably sensitive to, uh, to minima. Um, and, and we're looking at really trying to quantify how much noise can throw that off. Thank you. Thank you. Marco, you have a question for Adriana? Yes, thanks for the talk. <clears throat> um, if we take Brian Re Reynolds, for example, and um, instead of looking at, at him uh, from the front, we take a look at him from the side. Um, I mean, the image is not going to look as symmetric, although the object itself, well, the body itself is. So how are you tackling this? Another fabulous question. And so you may have noticed that when I was talking about the current convergent evolution of the flowers, I said we took all appropriate pictures from the poster. Because when you look closely at the poster, not all of them are kind of that head on where you see that, that rotational symmetry. So things like uh, there's a, flower, a picture of a daffodil that's kind of side on, so you can see the cup and a little bit of the flowers. But that wasn't appropriate for the measure because then the angle really skews what gets picked out as the symmetry measurements. So this is absolutely a, a concern. And so it kind of comes back to, I think, what you're trying to measure. So, uh, you know, if you wanted to say, uh, just to look at dorsal views during development, then that's, you know, that's an apples to apples comparison. Or, uh, for instance, in the zebrafish movie, there you were, we were looking at a lateral view. So, so we could really see that tail elongation. And certainly the, the TI curves that we get out will look different than if we've got, say, a strictly dorsal view. So we'll still have the tail elongation, but then we're not going to have that, uh, we're, we're, we're not going to have, uh, we're not going to get thrown off by the yolk sac uh, up near the head region there. So absolutely, the view that we use to calculate the TI very strongly influences uh, the minima that we get out. And, and so uh, it, you do have to be careful about how you actually, uh, how you're using your data to calculate the TI to make a meaningful comparison. Thank you. Uh, Maddie, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, uh, I was wondering if you've applied the TI metric to look at leaves as well as flowers, or if you've just restricted it to flowers so far. So actually, there's a I, I didn't have time for it, so I didn't include it. But if you go to the 2021 paper, um, it's it, it, so we were actually looking at leaf emergence. So uh, we had a uh, might have been SEM I, anyway, a cross section of a stem from catnip. And so the neat thing about that is that you've got kind of all of these sort of embryonic uh, proto leaves that are within the stem. And so for that one, we actually did a scaling transformation uh, to look at the, the recapitulation of the symmetry of the leaf placement of both the, the, the leaves that were actually out, as well as the nascent leaves that, that, are, that are found within the stem. And so we can use the minima of the TI, and that's more of a 2D because we're looking at both a scaling as well as an angle. So we have a, a surface of the, of the TI curve. And the minima of that does correspond to the symmetries uh, associated with these uh, different nascent leaf uh, uh, um, buds, 
I, I'm not sure of the terminology. Um, and certainly in terms of leaves, so again, in the 2021 paper, uh, and I showed the picture there, uh, it's a bay leaf. It's actually from my, my little bay tree that's in my, uh, in my sunroom. So my, 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 my house plants are published now. Um, and, uh, and so we, we did apply it to bay leaf. I would love to do it in more of a leaf developmental context, because I think that would be really cool to see that emergence of that bilateral symmetry. And I've spoken to some uh, colleagues in molecular genetics who focus on leaf development. Uh, the problem is, is that it can be very hard to capture that as a time series. So, uh, so it's something I'm really interested in doing, because I think that it would be really cool to see the emergence of those symmetries. Thank you, Adriana. So I'm going to stop recording. Um...